Hey friend. I had a really cool conversation today with someone that I hadn't spoken to in a long time. This is a, a woman who was a, another student, a fellow student on a teacher training program for music that I did over a year ago now, a year and a half ago. And and we had a we maintained a kind of just sort of professional conversation relationship for several months after that. And it was it's one of these interesting things where for whatever reason it seems like we just have we have things that the other person needs. It's like we sort of manage to offer each other the right reflection at the right time. So it's been a really satisfying uh, dialogue over the course of the last couple of years out of, uh, for that reason. And it's only, we, we hadn't talked in over six months now. It had been like long before the holidays since we last spoke. And so we reconnected today and I had, I was reminded of, or I, I was reminded slash I, I articulated something for myself that came out of offering her a reflection, but that also very almost instantaneously sort of manifested as an intention for myself. And basically, I was telling her about the book that I just read, um, Helping Parents Practice by Edmund Sprung, which if you followed my post, posts over the last week or so, it's all I've talked about. And, and, the, and it's, it's essentially, it's just a really smart, well-researched and, and a book written from a great deal of experience with young kids, their needs, their desires, how they work, and how to teach them, either as the music teacher or as the parent, sort of the home music coach. And as I was talking to my colleague today, it popped into my mind because she told me that she's teaching, she has a huge studio of, of young students right now, something like 29 kids, which is way more than I'm teaching. I'm basically teaching one kid. I'm teaching my daughter. But I, so I realized this is, if anything, more relevant to her than me, but, and but, one of the things that she, one of the frustrations or one of the desires she articulated was to be doing deep work and and doing deep work sometimes we can mistakenly think that if we're doing work at a kind of basic level then we're not doing deep work in other words if the students we're working with in music are not very advanced, we can think we're not doing, the work's not that deep. We're just teaching them sort of basic skills. But what Edmund Sprunger's book really, you know, points out, but also exhaustively illustrates, is that the art of teaching at that age is incredibly deep work. If anything, it gets easier as students become older because it becomes just a little bit more about the music itself and the uh, it takes a knowledge of the repertoire. But the the way in which understanding how a personality, how a young mind is engaging with the world and, and, and having managing to have a functional dialogue with that to really understand what they are looking for and then how to meet their needs while at the same time unrolling a pedagogy, a pedagogical process that that really they, they, they can take ownership of each individual bit that they get, that they sort of manage to wrap their, their, their heart, their mind, their ears, their body around. But they're not going to be really leading their own learning process until a few years down the road. I mean, they, they lead it 
in the Montessori sense of their interest should guide how we um, how we work with them. But if they're learning a classical instrument, there's going to be just stuff that they learn, and it's foundational, and you can't really do anything else until you've done it. So there's a there's a fair amount. I've always marveled at the amount of material. This is why you know people like to start their kids on this stuff early because it's a giant mountain of stuff. And and so as we're working with someone at that age. We're not just disseminating information. Like if we, that's I think the thing where we can get caught as teachers thinking that we're not doing deep work. Because if we think our job is to disseminate information and then kids are sort of variously responsive, but by and large young kids are gonna be, there's gonna be resistance. There's gonna be, there's gonna be, um, I mean, again, depending on how we teach, but there's, there, it, it's, a, it's a giant mountain of hard things to do. And more often than not, a kid is going to sort of be like, what, what, why, what, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to, they might, they might love the idea of being able to do it. Or they might have a vision of themselves playing a certain way or mastering something in a certain way. But between their vision of what they what they're being drawn towards and the actual practice of getting there, there's going to be a large gap. And that gap is what a good teacher and a good home coach have to fill. We have to take them from the vision of what they want to manifestation of that thing. And I was struck as I was speaking to my colleague and then reflecting on the on the book in the past couple of days of my sort of deep dive into that way of thinking. I was struck by the fact that taking this approach that Edmund Sprunger really kind of he hasn't turned I don't know what to call it because it's just like the way he thinks about teaching music he doesn't he hasn't titled it or given it a label. But taking an approach that is that is oriented around those principles, and loosely those principles are practicing the purpose of practice is to make things easier, not to play better or to make progress or to become a better musician. All of those will happen as a matter of course if we make practice about making things easier. But if we keep that in mind, that principle, if we are, as the teacher, oriented towards at every practice session, the child should have the experience of something becoming easier. We will construct our practice sessions very differently than if we just want to see them move a notch forward. Like there's four bars of music to learn. Did they learn them? Right? That's a totally different standard than something should become easier. It's like, I like to think of this as, you know, Ken Wilber, one of my favorite philosophers, always talks about the process of evolution is a process of transcend and include. As we transcend something, we go to a wider context, a wider sphere of consciousness, a wider awareness. And that doesn't mean we leave everything else behind, we include it. There are, sometimes we reject portions of what has come before so that we can move to a larger embrace but but we never reject all of it we're always kind of subsuming everything below so what we're looking for with practice is what are the principles or what are the intentions what are the motivations what are the what are the things we are aiming for the goals of practice that will inherently include all the other ones that need to be included, right? Musical excellence has to be included. Learning new repertoire has to be included. Developing musicianship has to be included. Getting a good sense of rhythm has to be included. All There's, a, there's an essentially infinite number of elements that need to be included. But we can get lost pursuing those elements and trying to make progress in these elements. But there are, there are ways of framing our overall intention 
that will inherently include all of that other learning. And that's what I think, if I could, if I had to sort of summarize Edmund Sprunger's approach to teaching, and especially teaching young people, I would say it's kind of that. And then he's got sort of a, he's got a philosophy of, he's got a, a couple of different sort of principles that he works by in terms of how he gives feedback and the, using questions instead of direct instruction and all these, all these kind of, not really tricks, they're just ways of working that he's learned that I was, I put him to use this morning. I had a, my first practice session back with my daughter this morning after ingesting this huge volume of work. And we were, had a little bit of a short practice. She didn't, she went to bed super late, so I had to wake her up super late. So we were kind of short changed on time, but the vibe was different. It was a different vibe. I sensed some things, even just in the first, even just with like one 30 minute practice session, I was like, okay, I can, I can, I can see, I see myself thinking a little differently. It was really exciting. And then the conversation, back to the conversation with my colleague, you know, looking at this way of thinking about music and this way of teaching. Almost as a perspective shift on what we're doing. If we think that our job is to drill a bunch of material into kids, see how far they get with their C major scale or their A major scale or their, you know, whatever piece, we're going to be pretty, it's not going to feel very deep. It's going to feel like, it's going to feel slow. Like it's likely to feel slow. You know, I'm sure we'll get our star students here and there, but it's going to, a lot of it's going to be a slog. But if every practice session is about meeting the needs of the child, figure, finding the under, finding the deeper need that the child is coming to the lesson with, meeting that need, ensuring that that need is met and understanding that meeting their need, for example, their need to, to, to feel like they are seen positively in the eyes of their parents and authority figures, giant need. And it's the, the basis, that, that need, and, when, and especially that need when it is not met, is the basis for a, a huge amount of the resistance that kids put up to learning something like music, not to mention other things. But if we understand that, and we know how to meet that need, and then on top of meeting that need, you know, which is partly a matter of knowing it's there, it's partly a matter of the strategies we use, it's partly a matter of how we roll out material, it's partly a matter of the kind of feedback we give. Meeting that need as we then introduce musical material, all of a sudden we're doing incredibly deep work. We're working on the level of the psychology and the emotional depths of the child and on music. And, and those things are going to interpenetrate and blend. And they're going to be ways, you know, it's not going to be a straight line, but there's going to be ways in which we watch the students, once their needs are being met consistently, we watch them blossom into the challenge of learning music really deeply sounds pretty great right like that sounds exciting that sounds like that sounds profound and it doesn't have to be because we're teaching the most advanced music to the most advanced student it can happen when we're it can happen literally in any lesson because every child no matter how undisciplined they may seem or how much in resistance they may seem how unenthusiastic they may seem if, if we start looking at it from the point of view of here are the needs that they have to have met or they will not be functional. We're doing deep work. There's just no other word for it. So it's an exciting thing to hear myself say because it kind of encapsulated, it sort of it encapsulated and expanded the understanding that I've gained over the last couple of days, which was really about myself and my daughter, but it took it to another level. And I felt like I was able to offer that to someone else and also 
make that conscious for myself in a nice way. So that's where I'm at today, people. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you. Have a great day. I will see you soon.